Hello and welcome to the Ryan Max Show. Today is a very special episode. I normally do a lot of political speak, have episodes where I just kind of run my thoughts on what the popular news cycle is. But sometimes it's great to get into a cultural conversation about what's going on around the country. And whether you're a Christian, whether you're a non-Christian, where you're Jewish, whether you're what other domination are you? Left, right, middle. It's important to have these conversations, and it's important to have them with people who have experienced the walks of life within those topics. Now, it's not easy in today's world where we have a culture of sexual brokenness and identity issues, and I think it's important to have those conversations to get us on the back on the right track and get those people, see if we can restore those back in the walk of Christ, if that's where they want their journey to be. Uh, I don't usually hinge on it too much. I like to kind of run with topics. And this one I had to come across at my desk and I couldn't pass it up. Uh, I want to bring on, he is a, a pastor and author of a book called Am I Gay? Coming out of cultural Christianity and LGBTQ identity and into uh, faith, genuine faith uh, in Christ. He is also has a network, Love and Truth Network, established for churches, pastors, leaders to restore those out of the sexual brokenness and into identity with Christ. So please welcome Gary Ingram from the Love and Truth Network and his latest book, Am I Gay? Welcome, Gary. Hey, Ryan. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit off air about your, your story a little bit, and uh, I'm intrigued to hear more because I think those who have the experience in this in this culture shock that we have going on where nobody really knows who they want to be, who they want to be with, it's important to have a conversation with somebody that's lived it. And I, I'm glad that you can come on and, and share that story with us and talk about your new book. So let's let's sure. dive right in. You wrote a book. Am I gay coming out of the identity crisis and uh, sexual brokenness in your walk with faith? What, what was your story and yeah. wh why did you write the book? Well, the book came out in uh, December of last year in 2023. And the, the subtitle kind of says it all. Um, I wanted to make sure that it was clear that I didn't just need uh, rescuing out of the LGBT world and space, but also out of cultural Christianity. My former pastor used to say often that one of his greatest concerns is that um, that so many people within the church have become inoculated to the gospel. They're so familiar with it. It's such it's something they kind of grew up with. Going to church and doing all those things um, is just kind of uh, something that's just done, rather than there being a deep and authentic relationship with Christ. So that was certainly what I lived for a long time. And so this book is really the story of growing up in a Christian home. I think a very um, typical Christian home with parents that. Uh, that certainly did love me and yet in their own brokenness and they came from a, a time when there was no counseling and and certainly there was the church was not really addressing how to how to be effective as parents in terms of shepherding the hearts of your children those kinds of things there might be more practical steps there but yeah. they just in their own brokenness they brought a lot of that into their um, rearing of their children and I love my mom and dad. They've both gone home to be with the Lord, but I'm so grateful for them. I'm so proud to be my father's son. But growing up, I really hated um, my home experience and particularly my dad's. The It wasn't really until becoming an adult uh, that I began to realize, hey, I'm not as smart, smart as I thought I was, uh, shocker, <laughs> and that my dad wasn't nearly as dumb as I thought he was. And, but but what happened early on for me was uh, really the rejection. My parents didn't want another child. So when I came along and my mom found out she was pregnant at 42 and my dad was 44, my next oldest sibling is five years older. I have um, three older brothers, one older sister. They were not happy about having another kid. And so that that started things off, you know, not so great. Yeah. And then when I was born, my mom came around to love me well. But my dad was very aloof and just kind of left me to be raised to my mom and my sister. And so that that feeling of, of rejection. I obviously yeah. didn't have a label for it when I was a little kid, but right. that feeling of rejection, not really being um, wanted by my dad. That, I mean, that changed later, but as a kid, yeah. that was important. And then um, yeah. also 
my older brothers, good guys, just they were old enough. They didn't want their little, you know, toddler brother running around with them and their friends. So yeah. there was also that sense of, of um, rejection there at school, public school, Christian school there, even at church, the, you know, I was always chosen last for the sports team. I was horrible at sports. The locker room was a nightmare. So really every day at school was just a, a series of names and bullying, getting beaten up in my locker, um, getting books knocked out of my hand, you know, every day getting tripped in the hallways. So that was just kind of the way life was, and I hated it. Right. And the only place I could find any kind of real connection was in the world of girls. And so I, right. I just kind of marinated in the feminine uh, throughout all of my developmental years. Right. And I tell my story um, based on unpacking four chapters early on, our chapters unpacking um, uh, childhood development and uh, those different stages of development, the four primary stages and where I was at in those stages. And then I just go on from there and tell the rest of my story up to the point of um, accepting Christ at 23 years of age. Right. Okay. So your relationship with your mom and your sister, who was the ones that primarily accepted you and, and raised you, did you think that had an impact as far as your curiosity and leaning towards a more feminine lifestyle early on? You yeah, I definitely think so. Point. I mean, yeah. we see that, you know, yeah. one parent households have a, a tend to have an effect nonetheless. But did do you think personally, did it have an effect on you not having your dad there um, to kind of be that rock that you needed? Well, regardless, you, there's feminine and masculine in qualities in, in both men and women. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but do you think it had more of an impact seeing as though you had the rejection factor and then you were bullied and picked on and your mom was the go to for support and you had your sister and because it's just a natural progression of gravitation. Right. 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 Okay. Yeah. Well, I think absolutely. I, I agree that that did have a big impact. I think, I mean, I wrestled, I, I, I was certainly different than my three older brothers. They were much more kind of rough and tumble, typical boys. And, and I was not that way. And right. so, but I, but I grew up in a home where, I mean, we would, all of us were hunters and, and yeah. we lived in the, in the country in upstate New York. And so, I mean, you just kind of do that. I did that as well. Right. And, you know, friends have said when I tell them some of my story of growing up, they're like, how did you turn out to be gay? You know, it's just it was so funny because they're like, yeah. you didn't grow up in a in a what you would think of as kind of a stereotypical right. environment. It, it definitely. And then in addition to that, my at five or six years of age, I was introduced by some older neighborhood boys to their dad's hardcore porn. They thought that'd yeah. be great sure. fun to introduce right. me to that at that stage. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. also um, their homosexual behavior as well. And I don't not be they were just they were. Right. They were experimenting and yeah. I was there for, for that. And it was defiling and I just loaded on more shame already on a little kid who's dealing with a lot of that already. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, all of that combined, yeah. I think had a, had a big impact. Yeah. So how was middle school and high school for you? Did that have, did that shape an impact on what you started to get into relationship wise with the, with the rejection issues and then the bullying and you know, all that. I mean, some people come from a background of sexual brokenness, usually generally from trauma related things that happened early sure. on they were abused or they were, you know, molested and, and neglected. But it's for the most part, it sounds like you just had just normal kind of upbringing aside from your dad kind of just not really wanting to, you know, much to be involved. So what was your middle school to high school time yeah. like? And in regards to all this, because that can be a really traumatic time when you're confused as to what's going on. Well, for sure. And I mean, kids can be unbelievably cruel to one another. And I mean, that included me back in the day, but I was yeah. usually the source, the source of uh, yeah. the, the, the teasing and the picking. So, and, and I just feel like I had a neon sign on my forehead saying bullies, you know, here I am or whatever. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, that had a big impact also the the reality of that early sexualization like i don't remember a time i can't think back far enough to when my brain wasn't filled with um, both the pornography and right. sexual things so that that pervasive what what there was something really shameful about that and dirty about that that sure. i didn't like but yeah. there was also something about the experience that filled in an emptiness like there's right. a void from my dad yeah. a void from not knowing who the heck i was yeah. as a boy not fitting in who am i and and somehow the pornography was even at that ridiculously early age way before puberty but certainly when puberty hit i mean man i was a porn addict you know oh, it was hmm. It was a it was a, a daily kind of things um, that that forms and shapes a child's brain throughout those stages of development. For Absolutely. sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when when did you find out that you were gay? When did you first find out that you realized that you were gay? At some point. Well, so I would say 
uh, to, to be clear about it. Yeah. I, I felt like, oh my gosh, I am gay. I'm more, I'm more drawn. I realized at some point it, it, in looking at pornography that my, I was drawn more toward images of men than women. And that was just something I kind of realized one day and I was horrified yeah. by that. Right. And, but the truth is, I don't think that I ever, I don't think that we are a born gay. And I don't think that it's a matter of, I don't think that it's helpful to, I, um, to it, to associate an identity with strong feelings and sure. even with behavior. Yeah. So, so in looking back, I wouldn't say that I was ever gay. And I talk about this in my book as well. And right. I don't find that to be unique to me. I was exclusively yeah. same-sex attracted. So when someone says you never really were, I'm like, right. I, I just laugh yeah. because right. it was for me, it was totally exclusive. There was a repulsion to the idea of ever being with a, a girl or a woman, never right. wanting to be married, never wanting to be a father, two of the greatest joys of my life today, by the way. Right. So yeah, I, so the idea, it was early on, uh, probably around puberty, when I realized, oh yeah, I'm completely drawn to these images right. of guys so and curious time. about them. And right. part of that is because, again, I marinated in the world of, of the feminine through all yeah. of my developmental years. Right. And so yeah. things aren't even, I know them, they're totally right. familiar to me. It's my own, it's, it's boys, it's my own. Right you know, even God given legitimate need to be known in my, by my own gender and to kind sure. of get to know who I am in relationship to my own gender. I missed all of that. And right. now this gender is mysterious to me. And often, and usually what, what we find mysterious uh, is also what we, we tend to find attractive as well. Yeah. It piques your curiosity because right. you don't know, you know, where you stand as your own. Yep. You know. Um. So how did your, how did your parents take that? I know you said you had a closer relationship with your mom than your dad. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you, explain to them what was going on well i told my mom one day and i was young i might have been 16 or something i told her one day what i was i think mom I, I think maybe i'm gay and she just kind of gasped and said oh honey i was so i've been so afraid that you're going to tell me tell me that one day like yeah. okay not the best response but okay and then i didn't tell my dad and then my mother said in that same conversation she kind of gasped and said did your dad hear you and i looked up and he my dad was had horrible hearing, but apparently that day some miraculous thing happened and he's down the, down the driveway, filling in some potholes from a rainstorm the night before. And, yeah. and he's leaning on his shovel and looking straight at me. I mean, my heart was in my throat when yeah. I quickly looked away, <laughs> but we yeah. never talked about it. Yeah. Nothing yeah. was ever said. I know my mom said something to him, but we never talked, he never talked to me about it. So, yeah. well, I mean, it wasn't until many years later yeah. that kind of just in conversation as the Lord was changing my life and and that that we would sort of have these kind of i don't know matter of fact little little statements little conversations here and there and my dad and i as i said he he and i became super close when i was probably 35 you know and toward the end of my uh, later in my 30s yeah. and into my 40s i got married to melissa we've been married now almost 17 years but we got married we met in 2004 so my parents mm -hmm. lived with me at the time they were elderly and uh, but yeah we had developed a really good relationship then but that didn't make up for all of those years of those developmental right. years of right. having you know not much of anything with him okay um so you met your wife melissa and yeah. she also is a christian counselor still right correct yeah, she is a licensed Christian counselor. So, yes, and I think she's a smarty pants in the family. Yep. Yeah, you both mentioned you came from that background, right? So, what? How did you meet, and how did she? What background does she have as far as the the identity yeah. and well, all that? Well, there was a lot of brokenness in her life, particularly with her dad, and she saw how her her father, how she perceived her father to or her mother to kind of be a victim, like stuck in this world. Uh, she could see that her father didn't didn't practice or act like he loved um, his her mother. And mm -hmm. there was an occasion where he came home from a business trip and he was staying away longer and longer and longer periods of time. And no one was talking about it at all. And the kids didn't know what was going on, but she came around the corner just as he had gotten home and she went, her, her mother went to kiss uh, her father and he recoiled back like in disgust. And she saw that. And in that instant, um, this was years later when she was in a prayer time, that memory came back up and she knew in that instant, like her heart said, I will never, ever be like my mother, dependent emotionally or financially dependent right. on a man. And that was when she was like 13, maybe 14. And, uh, but she got into several long-term relationships with guys and looking for the love that she wasn't getting from her father and some kind of consistency that she wasn't getting from him. And then when she was at George Washington University, she was actually engaged to be married. Uh, she was 
um, acing all of her tests. She was doing great um, in, in her classes. And here she's moving toward marriage. Everything should be great, but she's getting more and more <laughs> depressed all the time. Well, finally, a friend of her said, hey, have you ever thought about dating so-and-so? And so-and-so was a woman. And she's like, what? You know, and and But once that question yeah. came and that door was kind of kicked open, she right. she began to ruminate on that. And eventually she broke off her engagement to the, uh, this guy, to her fiance, and she started seeing a woman. And she felt like in that moment, she's like, oh my gosh, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. And, and so that was a really powerful um, uh, draw. And then it was just a couple of months later, I think, when this woman dumped her. And, mm -hmm. and what Melissa would say is it's like all of the, the crisis of all of her past relationships came crashing down on her. It wasn't right. just about this woman yeah. um, because she didn't even know her all that well. But, right. but it, was, it was a horrible season of her life. And she's crying out to God. They grew up in a religious home, not a Christian home necessarily. Yeah. And, um, and so her sister, her identical twin sister, had gotten saved uh, a couple years prior. And so she, her sister invited her to go to an, the Urbana uh, conference where there's like 10,000 students yeah. uh, out in Illinois, I think it was. And yeah. she went and, um, and that's where sh she heard a guy talk about coming out of homosexuality. I mean, she actually was looking through this, you know, every day there's this magazine basically of all of the different uh, workshops and different things going on that day. Cause it's so huge. Mm -hmm. And she was reading this by her sister and, and she came across this one where the guy is talking about coming out of homosexuality and literally, I don't know if I can swear on your program, but she, literally, yeah. yeah, she said, my gosh, I've got to go and listen to this. This is a bunch of shit. And so, and so her sister's like, okay, you know, and so she gets up and goes and she's listening and the guy is teaching out of Genesis 1, 26 and 27 about being made male and female in the image yeah. of God. And Melissa is getting absolute, <laughs> she's coming unglued because all she's hearing is, Men are better than women. Men are better than women. And she says yeah. he never said that, but that was the paradigm that she was right. seeing it all through and listening to yeah. it all through. Finally, a woman got up and shared her testimony. Thank God for this woman. She got up and shared her testimony of getting involved with another woman in her Bible study while they were both in this Bible study. And, and they got involved, emotionally involved, emotionally enmeshed. And, and then they cro started crossing sexual boundaries. And this woman finally said, wait a minute, we've got to look at what the Bible says about this. Yep. And nail this down one way or the other. The woman giving her testimony said she realized, look, this is this is not God's will. Her partner said, I know it's not, but I don't care. I'm going to do this anyway. So she went off into lesbianism. This other woman repented. And and here is the thing that the Holy Spirit used, you know, like a stone between Melissa's mm -hmm. eyes, which was mm -hmm. just because I felt something didn't make it right. And boom, right. the Holy yeah. Spirit used those words. And Melissa's like, that is my entire justification. Yeah. was my entire justification for this relationship that I just got dumped from and right. thinking that I'm still a lesbian. And so she, she went forward and accepted Christ and, and, but she knew she immediately began to ask the counselor, well, what do I do now? Because she realized just because she had accepted Christ, it didn't, it didn't automatically change sure. how yeah. her, how her thinking was distorted toward yeah. men and toward women and objectifying right. others. And so that was a long journey, but that was, that was the beginning of, of Melissa coming to faith. Wow, that's a, that's a powerful story. You know, you see, yeah. today's world, we're so stuck on the idea that if you were you were living a broken life and came from a broken household, you can't be restored. And your story and Melissa's story and so many others, there are so many opportunities to just open that door to be yes. restored from whatever troubles you, and especially with the identity crisis we're having today in our country. I've, I've had plenty of gay friends. I, I've seen, I walked with all the cause of life where I've had people who like to just wear dresses and wear makeup. And I was, you know, it's very, I'm very nice, open to them. You know, I respect their ideas that are different, but uh, you know, as a Christian and a believer in Christ and the path that I was on, you know, there's a way you can denounce somebody's beliefs without having to be so nasty to people. And today, yes, you yes. can't have that conversation. You either are right or left and or wrong because the one side will absolutely open the door to all kinds of silly ideas that, you know, and now we're passing it down to our children. And, you know, I used to be on, you know, okay, whatever, just you do you over there in the corner, mm -hmm. just leave me and my alone. But now that I have, I have two boys or 10 and 12 and, you know, I have nieces and nephews and, and I'm, I work in a school district. It's almost like I, God was calling me, Hey, help the children because they can't help themselves. Yes. Yes. And then now I've gotten to a realm where I'm, I'm a voice for that and to speak mm -hmm. out. Yes. You, you know what you do, you as an adult, you're a grown adult, whatever lifestyle you want to live. 
but so much of this has been pushed down to our children and yeah, so leave many, the kids alone a political issue and mm -hmm. it really isn't a political issue it it's a it's a right or wrong issue you you're born a male you're born a female in today's society it's like well you can just do whatever because everybody accepts it. as christians we even come fault with that we accept it like okay well it is what it is it's not happening to me but i think as christians we have kind of an ob obligation to kind of especially with biblical sense of fighting for the children the most innocent in god's eyes yep. and th those are the ones we really should be fighting for and some of this nonsense of puberty blockers and the fact that they're they can say that they're more depressed since they aren't getting puberty blockers and changing their 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 lifestyle there there's nothing wrong with being 18 and deciding you want to completely change and alter your identity you do that fine but when you start bringing children into it and forcing the issue with somebody that has no idea what they are what they're doing i feel like that's wrong and i feel like as a society we have an obligation to protect that yeah and i and i agree with you ryan i i would just say that for me like the idea of turning 18 and there's nothing wrong with trying to become the other gender i i do think there's something wrong with that but i don't <laughs> but i think people can can make choices about what they want oh, to do sure. yeah right. yeah that's what so, i was getting at yeah yes so there's definitely something wrong with it because it's impossible i mean a man yeah, cannot right. become a woman a woman cannot become a man yeah. and and to pretend that that actually is a good thing or can be done right. what what i find to be tragic is is that um, in, in transgenderism, of course, I, I see that as exploding from what was strictly once, well, what was once gender identity disorder yeah. it, with, that got changed in, in the DSM, I think it's the five, that where they changed from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria to, yeah. to give it more of... To, to shift it away from there's something wrong with the identity disorder to yeah. now, no, we're going to deal with the dysphoria that you feel about right. being in the wrong body. And we're going to help you feel comfortable right. about shifting to this other you know, so-called, you know, this other sex or other gender. And, and of course that's, that's impossible to do, but the, the tragedy there is that people are in need of help and care yeah. and we aren't caring for them well when we put them on um, a lifelong medicalization in most instances where the pharmaceutical company is benefiting in in a huge oh, yeah, way sure. and also doctors and and you know hospitals or whatever they're doing these surgeries and, and it's just a tragedy in every way shape and form but especially when it comes down to um children and of course chloe cole is probably the poster child right now yeah. she's 19 right. but she's she's one who is speaking out against the the travesty being done against kids she was six she was 15 i think when she had her breast removed right. and then 16 i believe when she finally realized wait a minute this is completely wrong yeah. another thing you mentioned too ryan i just wanted to quickly jump uh, to mention yeah. uh is the idea i oftentimes my wife and i oftentimes talk about the fact that christians we need to learn how to do a far better job of separating ideology which we yes. can stand against right and stand against firmly but with grace as well yes uh, from individuals who are struggling individuals that that oftentimes make up that ideology we also have to understand that many people within the lgbt community don't want anything to do with the political oh, ideology absolutely. right i mean yeah. it's so easy to kind of lump everybody into you know yeah. this caricature just like the christian church is lumped into the caricature of westboro baptist i mean right. who wants to be them you know what i mean <laughs> nobody yeah. Except yeah. them. Yeah. So you have, you know, the LGB, which has always been kind of a, a, a thing in our culture, you know, we, and then you start bringing the T into it and then yes. you start bringing the, the Q into it. And then you start bringing the, the plus and then you get you know, some of these weird, strong out alphabetical changes. And you see some of the conservative voices that have gone in college debates and debated some of these, these right. people that absolutely right. just lost their minds. But you you mentioned earlier, it is a severe mental condition. And there's there's health care for that. And they're denying the health care because they think it's a, a social issue. Gender is a social construct. You can change who you are just like you can change magically change your name. And I, I think we're going down a wrong path as a society, as a culture, if we're just openly everything is accepted and you can do whatever you want with your body. Yep. And I think to openly deny man female and the culture of today's sports where men can compete in women's sports and yeah. uh, men can get pregnant and women can, you know, lump off their breasts and change who they are. It's, it's destroying the very fabric that God founded for us. Yeah. And we know that as Christians, we're not perfect. None of us aspire to be perfect. At least some of us, maybe we, we do, I don't know, but we're not Christ, but we can be Christ like in our walk. And we are all broken. Every one of us, I think can admit mm -hmm. that some of us better than others. But I think there's a path forward 
where we can start up to stand up and say enough is enough. We can't keep going down this path of openly yep. accepting what is happening to our, our generations. This is maddening. It, well, it is. And, and that actually also points to something that is probably at least a cornerstone of what our ministry is about. And that is, so I, I was a pastor on pastoral staff yep. for 12 years. And, and now a lot of the work I do is working with pastors around the country on not just LGBT issues, but frankly, right. what I'm about to say now, which is sexual sin in the church is a rampant, massive Absolutely. stage three or four cancer yeah. that is hidden. It's the one organization that hides it. Everybody mm -hmm. else is out flaunting it, right? Yeah. And, and celebrating yeah. it. But the church is in so many ways. I mean, when Jesus nails the Pharisees for cleaning the outside of the cup so fastidiously yeah. and leaving the inside so full of garbage and mm -hmm. that they are like whitewashed tombs with dead men's bones and all kinds of uncleanness on the on the inside as well. He could go to nearly every American church and and give that same message to the vast majority of Christians. And so our message is we love the church. It's not right. about wanting to poke, you know, poke the eye of the church, but it, right. rather it's about, hey, if we're going to actually be equipped to love people who are lost and broken and hurting, love people like me. I was right. a mess. I was mm -hmm. very difficult to walk with, you know, at one time. Um, my wife might say still today a little bit, but <laughs> but at one time, really an emotional mess. But but the Lord picked me up and drew me out of the 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 place that I was in. And through a process of discipleship, there was some spiritual warfare in there as well of, of getting rid of some critters that I had invited mm -hmm. in so by by my not just by LGBT behavior, but by sexual sin that was repeated, I think there are many Christians who are so compromised, yeah. if, whether it's pornography addiction, even in the pulpit, you know, there's, yeah. and all, this is increasingly an issue for, for women, especially younger women, uh, Christians. Yeah. And so this issue, like this is a holistic thing. We need to do some housekeeping, not for the sake of shaming, exposing right. and shaming right. people, but yeah. to say, look, there's no one more miserable than a Christian who's living a compromised double life. I know it. And yeah. so we love you too much to leave you here. Right. We want to, we want to create an environment in the church. We want to help pastors shift their church environments from what they kind of are right now, where everybody, everybody comes and pretends, puts on a good image and pretends to be okay. Kind of the idol of the good fault self. Mm -hmm. And we want to help the, the uh, churches actually shift to become teaching hospitals where right. people are prepared and equipped to help people who are really broken, whether that's people coming out of the LGBT community or other places, drug addiction, food addiction, fill in the blanks. Yeah. The, the church is meant to be that kind of field hospital, frontline yeah. ministry. And oftentimes we don't operate that way. Right. Because I think a, a big part of the church is too focused on what you said earlier, just not shaming as much as like, ew, what? I'm, yeah. I'm not, I can't help you. It's kind of like that Pharisee mentality. Mm -hmm. I'm above you because I don't, you know, believe in your life. Yeah. And that's par part of the problem with the church today that they, we feel like we're above people who are broken. The very 12 people who Jesus picked to, to follow him were all sorts of broken from different backgrounds. So uh, I think by design, he chose people who are broken because he knew those would be the most helpful in his mission to restore humanity. Not that, yep. you know, it's a good thing to be broken and be fixed again. But I think that the, uh, the idea behind it was I can take a complete mess and restore them and use them as my tool for ministry going forward. And that will be a bigger savior than somebody who's been righteous their whole life. Right. There's not a bad thing there being, you know, on that thin and narrow walk with Christ your whole life. But I think there's a real walk, a real walk when you've actually experienced the brokenness. So like so many of his followers yeah. did. And I think that's so, so many of those types of people come out to be the best pastors, come out to be the best ministry leaders, come out to be the best counselors because they've lived those broken experiences. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's probably what drew me to you most about bringing you on because mm -hmm. we both come from this broken background and it's really, it's blinded because like you said, your, your upbringing, you weren't traumatically, you know, abused. You weren't neglected. You just had different relations, the dichotomy um, and not from a typical household that would, okay, that makes sense. Why they're 47 genders because they were abused by an uncle or a grandparent mm -hmm. or whatever, or they were left behind. But Christian families, whole Christian families are not, um, you know, injury prone. You know, they're fi not fireproof. They have problems too. Right. You can still have the most religious upbringing and have all kinds of fires going on. Yep. So I think the what my point was, like, I I'm really glad that you've opened up this door 
and led your services to restore others on this walk. And I think it's a great thing to do. And I would love to be more part of it um, as well. I think we need more voices in that. I mean, more people who look, I've experienced the brokenness and now I've come out of that. Let me help you do the same. Mm -hmm. That's probably the best way you can put it. Well, and we also, I mean, our emphasis in ministry isn't even, isn't so much on helping strugglers. I mean, I, I do some individual mentoring and we want to get people connected wherever we possibly can. Right. And we also want to be really collaborative with other great ministries. There's a lot of stuff that masquerades as Christian or, mm -hmm. or it is, but it's, right. it's not what we feel is the best stuff out there. Yeah. So there, there are a lot of great organizations we can connect people with, but our main purpose for a ministry, Love and Truth Network, our main mission and purpose is to equip equip the church. It's to, it's to help and bless the church because we know right. we can help far more people if we can help the church uh, yeah. be strengthened and equipped to be both confident and joyful. And that, right. I know those two right. words, I mean, anybody dealing in this space in the church, they do not feel confident or, or joyful. I mean, it's very rare <laughs> yeah. if you're going to find somebody yeah. that feels that way. Yeah. But I say that because there is a lot of joy in seeing God transform a life from being so broken and so fixated on mm -hmm. this craving for love and affection and going about it and winding up in some of the worst places that you can yeah. places you never thought you would go right. in, in pursuit of this stuff. And, and yet um, God in his ability to use the body of Christ to transform lives, that is such an incredibly uh, beautiful, joyful thing to be a part of. Yeah. We want the church to experience that. Yeah. And we want to equip the church to be a blessing in that regard. The other thing I just want to quickly say, yeah. you mentioned, and I agree with you, that when someone comes out of uh, particular areas of brokenness, I mean, that's yeah. it, that's the person I want to go to and right. and and hear from and and walk with. But I also want to just say that like we have a, a member of our board who has never, he and, his, he and his wife have never really, either one of them dealt with a whole bunch of sexual brokenness or any of that. They've yeah. really loved Jesus for years, but but they also have a real understanding of the grace of God and, and the full orb grace of God, not, not what's preached today, which is almost a license for sin in a lot of ways, but that yeah. empowerment as well, yeah. that's a part of grace. And there's a way in which th they just don't have that looking down your nose, kind of sure. a Pharisaic kind of opinion. So God can even use, if anyone's listening or watching this and they're feeling like, well, I don't have this crazy story like Gary's talking about. Yeah. It doesn't, I mean, there's a way in which that can be helpful for someone dealing with those specific issues. Sure. But yeah. even if you haven't had that, if you've had a pretty squeaky clean life, frankly, in this culture, mm -hmm. that's the amazing story right there. <laughs> yeah. And if you... Yeah understand your own fleshly pull toward depravity and all of that. And, and you don't see yourself as being, you know, you're cut from the same cloth as everybody else potentially. And you just kind of live in that space of humility. You could be used in profound ways in really broken lives. Yeah. You know, it's not just the sexual brokenness, but you know, right. that's because of what you've been called to, to work with, but brokenness in general, you know, from yep. humbling sins We're all broken. To, to relationship issues, to, you know, running in and out of uh, children and, and relationships and marriages, and divorce yeah. and all that stuff. There's all kinds of brokenness where it leads to down a broken path away from Christ. You know, we, we talked about something earlier that how how damaging is the porn industry to the effect on marriages? I mean, I I came from relationship backgrounds when I was younger and I was in and out of relationships because I just, I if, like you said, I filled the void that I, that I had from being broken from a first serious relationship. So I didn't know how to kind of come together after that in a right way. Mm -hmm. I just led down different paths. So how damaging has the porn industry been on relationships, on marriage, the whole of marriage in general? Because now we have the Defense of Marriage Act changed to allow anybody of all kinds of, of backgrounds to be married. And that's breaking up the true identity and covenant we have with Christ and marriage. So right. how damaging has that been? Well, I mean, I, pornography is not some benign, fun thing that adults engage in. I mean, we know that it changes brain development in children, that it really does mess with the ability for people to uh, to to bond well. When, when you're bonding uh, through pornography use and masturbation and repeating that over and over and over again, and you're looking, usually kind of looking for specific um, themes of, of things that, that 
turn you on. I mean, those things you wind up bonding to and forming attachment to. It There was a, a Time Magazine article. I keep thinking, I think it was in 2017, so quite a while ago, and I think it was April, maybe. The, the, the cover of the magazine was the word porn with a circle around it and a line going through it. And the, the lead article of that magazine was about young men not Christians by any stretch, but young men who are standing up against pornography because their brains have been so pornified throughout mm -hmm. teen their teenage right. years that they couldn't even have sex with a woman. Um, and, and again, as a Christian, I don't think we shouldn't be doing that until we right. are married anyway. Right. But the point is, is here you have these these young men in the prime of their life sexually, yep. and they can't even engage sexually because yep. of all the porn use and masturbation that's yeah. going on uh, in yeah. their lives. So. That alone um, is, yeah, is a huge testament. A, a physical thing, right? You know, obviously yeah. when you're doing neurological, you, yeah, yeah. So, and then all you get to the side of the relational issues. Now you have a false sense of um, want and need that no woman can possibly fulfill realistically yep. because you have this image of what a woman should do, should be like, and not even just the porn industry, but the celebrity lifestyle of what a woman right. is depicted in today. No real woman, honest woman, can compete with that. So then you have a whole another idea of brokenness where you can't you can't feel satisfied enough because you're doing things the way you see fit for a temporary mm -hmm. sense of feeling, right? Well, yeah, uh, absolutely. absolutely. And you think about the fact too, that just scientifically, biologically, yeah. God made us, I mean, think about this as male and female, the simplicity yeah. of that, the, the order of that, the goodness of that. It's out of that union that life can happen, that, that eternal beings are birthed into this world. And, and it's the only uh, dynamic where that happens. Uh, natural law, even uh, set aside scripture, natural law right. really does make it abundantly clear that a man was made for a woman, a woman was made for a man. But yeah. the the other um, dynamic is that God made it in such a way that he intended for a man and a woman to come together uh, after marriage and to form this sexual union. And in that union and, and through orgasm and the release of chemicals and all of that, mm -hmm. that there is a bond that happens right. between a husband and a wife that more, that deeply seals them yeah. together. Well, when we treat sex recreationally right. and whether it's heterosexual, homosexual, whatever, mm -hmm. when we treat that recreationally, we're bonding to all of these different people. Uh, I mean, it, it's so, so it's disordered in yeah. so many ways that, that ultimately does. That's why Paul, Paul's not being this, killjoy when he says in first corinthians 6 18 flee run away from sexual immorality every other yeah. sin that a man commits is outside the body or woman mm -hmm. the the one who sins sexually sins against their own body he's not right. being a killjoy he's like saying you know what you're on the 10th floor and there is a fire raging in this building you've got to get away from this yeah. and and so he's warning us and instead we're like yeah. oh paul you know yeah. come on yeah. Yeah, your sense of identity and your sense of bond with your with your wife, um, and both my wife and I both come from that kind of broken background a little bit. You know, we both mm -hmm. feel like, oh man, I really wish this wasn't the way. But you know, we can't change what happened right. in the past. Right. What we can do is change what we believe going forward and how we can best correct the path going forward. Yes. So that's what we did when we got married. Um, but so much of society has been so open to breaking those bonds and using sex as kind of like a temporary feel good and then moving on to the next person, moving on to the next person or the next thing that gives us that sense of false, you know, excitement. Mm -hmm. And you're true. It's like the, some of the cultural issues that the, the athletes come across today, you know, Harrison Bucker from Kansas city chiefs has been roasted over the coals. Yep. Simply yep. for going to a, a Catholic conference and a right. ceremony speaking in front of a bunch of Catholic men and women giving yep. it own beliefs and suddenly yep. the left loses their mind because you can't say those things on a national platform. Yes. He didn't do it on the football field. He did it at a private ceremony and he's right. roasted over the coals. Where are we at where we can't even have a difference of opinion and beliefs anymore in society? I mean, I just, it's nuts. Well, it, I mean, certainly I, I understand and certainly agree with that, but of I, I also know that there are plenty of, of Christians who, uh, tend to be more explosive. And rather than, I think one of the best things we can do as Christians is to ask somebody, you know, I don't, if you're willing, I would love to hear more of your story. Like, yeah. I would love to hear how you understand yourself to be right. tra transgender. If you're, if you're willing to share that, I'm willing right. to be open with you about my story and what God's done in my mm -hmm. life or how I've come to understand who I am today. If you're yeah. interested, but I would love to hear your story. And again, whatever that story is, whether it's yeah. We should just be asking each other those questions more often. That the understanding of someone's walk, we, we don't get yeah. that. We're just lambasting them for walking in that. Right. You know, we don't under, right. Too much of our, our broken ideology system is 
you feel this way, I feel this way, but we don't have a conversation of, well, how did you get to feel that way? Yes. Or what yes. is, why is your story different than mine? Well, it's because we took two different paths or God put us on two different paths. We experience things differently. Why is it that you feel you have no gender to belong to? What, you know, what made, what happened? And that's where we got, we lost that understanding of individuals instead of just treating people as humans and having right. a conversation that we pump become pol uh, polarized as an ideology. And I think it's a real problem and I don't know how to fix it outside of just starting a conversation. <laughs> That's right. all you can do. No, I think, I mean, I believe that first of all, I believe that biblical love, the love that is generated uh, by God and through his people, that kind of love is it would, motivates us to open our mouths and to not just be silent. We, we love to hide behind, I, I think it's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, mm -hmm. you know, uh, at all times preach the gospel when necessary, use words. And we're like, oh, good, I don't have to, I don't have to say anything. You know, no, yeah. we do yeah. have to say something, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we just have to do it. The, the point is, live your life in public and in private, be, right. be one person. Right. And 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 preach the gospel in the way that you live, live the gospel basically. But right. we also have to use words too. Yeah. And so finding ways of of in in gentleness and in grace, but again with with courage, stepping into difficult places and asking those questions and 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 again, just maybe being even more open ended with the question, just to so it doesn't sound like you know we're being really specific about what we want to hear or we want to hone in on explaining why you're wrong about again hold the bible verses right. hold the sure. uh, the you know the the gavel or whatever and just mm -hmm. listen because that's going to give us a better understanding too of even how to pray for them if they're family mm -hmm. members or loved ones or whatever how to pray for them how to how to kind of walk with them how to um even re-engage in the next conversation maybe or or find a way of doing that so i, I think that there but that but nothing can replace a genuine love but at the same time or it's not even a but it's Right along with that, 1 Corinthians um, 13, the love chapter, in verse 6, Paul says, Do, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Mm -hmm. There are lots of Christians rejoicing in unrighteousness. There's yeah. lots of Christians who are celebrating, placating, going yeah. along with things that actually do not produce human thriving in right. the people they claim to love. And, I, mm -hmm. and I, it's hard. It's, it's really hard to, um, incredibly hard to not support a marriage that God designed to be between one man and one woman as a reflection is mm -hmm. the only metaphor of Christ in the church. Right. And then when you're invited to a gay wedding as an example, I know you haven't right. even asked this and here I'm dropping a bomb, but um, <laughs> in terms of going oh. to a gay wedding or a gay ceremony, then, you know, if you choose not to go to that, and I think there's lots of biblical reason for choosing not to and yeah. having a really heartfelt conversation uh, right. in a, with the person who's invited you, don't just mm -hmm. avoid it have right. the conversation, maybe yeah. a tearful one, but explain right. why, because of what God's designed. And be, right. and frankly, I love you too much to go. Not right. because I love you, but, but no, right. I love you too yeah. much to go because it, I actually think my presence is confusing, not only to you. I know you want me there because there's some, me being there, I, people go to weddings because they're there to celebrate. They're there right. to affirm, but it's also confusing to the people who are there who mm -hmm. assume now that I am agreeing and affirming and blessing this mm -hmm. because I'm simply there and they have no other reason of knowing that I, you know, what, why else would I be there if not for that? Yeah. So there's a lot of reasons that I, that I think it, it makes a lot of sense. And it's a hard, it, it's really hard when you as the Christian couple, the Christian individual, you're not going to a family member's wedding and all of your other Christian relatives are going and they think you're the biggest jerk on the planet for right. not going and actually, right. You're doing what Paul said in First Corinthians uh, yeah. thirteen six. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. I, I think we can we can love biblically, mm -hmm. and and really love with a heart that's connected and available. But the point, but the truth is that's hard to do because it it hurts. It's supposed to. It's not supposed to feel right. good to love in truth, and it's supposed to be kind of that convicting kind of feeling, right? You you want to love somebody completely, but you have to understand that you have to tell them truthfully how right. things are. You can't just you know, beat around the bush and call it what it is. If you see something, call it out. But you can speak truth, yeah. and power, and, and love in the way. Um, I want to get to a couple of questions uh, culturally sure. about what we're going on, going through, especially with regards to pastors or or um, bakers or small business owners. You know, <laughs> the, the Poor Jack Court Phillips. Case, so yeah, Jack, Jack. So yeah, that case. My dad's a photographer for 15, 20 years, and so he recently retired and. 
I think he's only had maybe once or twice a question like, Hey, will you do our wedding? We like your photo your photos and things like that. And he said, you know, I, I, I celebrate the fact that you want to do a wedding and I, I'm grateful for that, but I can't in my beliefs do that. Can, could, would you be, you know, offended if I turned you down be simply because of my beliefs. And I, they said, no, we're just, we're sorry. We're just, we like your work. And, but that's the way it should have been handled. Right. You right. have somebody in Colorado. Right who pulled a Karen and said, you make me this cake. I have a right lady. You don't have a right to get a cake baked by anybody. Right. <laughs> We've gone too far as a society where if you have a difference of beliefs, you're now forced to pretend somebody else's and affirm somebody else's beliefs and you have to serve them or else. I mean, it, yeah. And there, and there are 10 other businesses that would line up to, oh, to be delighted yeah. to do the gay wedding. Right. It's right. not like, and it oh, wasn't goodness. Just for yeah. the fault. He just turned it down because of, I don't, you know, he, obviously doesn't believe in that lifestyle, but he's, he didn't do it for just simply that he's like, it's a goes against core beliefs as an individual, as a Christian, I can't, he was happy to sell them product right. and, and but not them. to use his artistic creativity right. to, to <laughs> develop something yeah. he didn't believe in. And that's what I believe everybody should do. Even if you believe something wrong, convict yourself in that belief. And that way, nobody will have a problem with it. But the yelling and uh, clawing of the faces when somebody doesn't make you something simply because you want them to, when there's, you know, we're in a society of a free market of opportunities. There's another yep. cake baker down the street, probably as open as anybody would have been able to do it for nothing. And instead we're making people a f that either, yes, this is my lifestyle and I'm pretending to be a boy and a girl and a woman and women can get uh, to be a man and men can get pregnant. And now I'm forced to, to send my kids somewhere else to school because this, Christian teacher doesn't affirm that he's not a boy and he's a boy. Clearly, yep. I don't understand how far we have come as a society when we can't have basic conversations. Like we said earlier, you just, you can't, somebody believes something different than you and it's okay. But yeah, and I think the Muslim baker, I think the Muslim baker, the Jewish baker, that I, I wouldn't expect them to be doing some artistic design with Jesus is Lord or Christ is King or, you yeah. know, I mean, of course they don't. And if somebody went to them, uh, they have every right to say, yeah, that, that, yeah, right. that doesn't I, I, fit. As yeah. an individual in that situation, I wouldn't want somebody to right. not want to make me a cake because right. of that. I would go somewhere where I would be openly yes. welcome. Like, yes, I'll make you a cake. I wouldn't want to force it on somebody right. that didn't want to do it. Of course. I, I just, I don't understand the, the, maybe it was for fame and, you know, dollar amount. I don't know. But this affirmation lifestyle that we live in where you have to pretend and go against your beliefs or else, is is nutty and insane and yeah. we we don't i don't know where we go to fix that other than just have conversations you know and i think if we get back to those and understanding people's stories and their backgrounds and i think we'll better understand how they got to be where they are instead of just brushing them off as you're crazy yeah i th i feel like i from my perspective i think christians need to get a lot more active again with grace but right. get a lot more. There's a reason we named our ministry Love and Truth Network, right? right. We, our tagline is leading with love anchored in yeah. truth. But I think there there's a way that Christians can get much more active in in running for school boards and getting involved in, Absolutely. you know, being a precinct committee man and getting involved yeah. in having a voice in in the uh, policy sphere of, yeah. of our country. But at the end of the day, I think that's a very good thing and something we should we should be involved in rather than just right. griping about the situation. Yeah. Yeah, the I feel like, oh, I don't really have any more time, but I'm going to at least do this. Right. Yeah. I'm, and, like, I'm, uh, I'm not doing anything about it. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, but at the same time, then I, I think because Jesus said that they will know your, my disciples by the love mm. that you have for one another. And Absolutely. I don't think that the church embodies the kind of love that Jesus had in mind. I think that there's a lot that goes on in the church. Again, we show up and kind of punch our time cards and we we do we do the church thing. We listen to a, a great message. I mean, I'm so grateful for my church. Yeah. But we listen to a great message. There's worship that goes on, but there has to be a lot more going on in terms of body life and in yeah. terms of of this transformation of of becoming more and more like Jesus over right. the course of time. Not yeah. just like him in terms of sinning less, yes, oh, but sure. even more importantly, becoming more like him in terms of the way we love others, in the right. in terms of the way that we Psalm 68, 6, I often quote this verse, God takes the lonely and puts them in family. The nature and the heart of God is to draw people into this family, right. this body of Christ. And do we actually have room and space? Not only do we, do we have the room and space, 
to, to bring them in? The answer is yes, we have the room and space, but do we have the heart to bring in broken people who are messy uh, into our well-ordered and well-manicured churches? I mean, we're not, again, living out or embodying the, the gospel and what we've been called to in terms of the Great Commission when we limit those who can be among us because they're messy. And again, that was me. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on. I think, too, we get too worried about complaining about other people's lifestyles and not welcoming them in and transforming them authentically and not just yelling right. at them from across the way. Be more Christ-like embodies the spirit of taking action versus just saying and doing the right things. I think you're spot on. Gary, it's been a pleasure speaking. Thank you so much for coming on, telling your story. Where can everybody get your book? Sure. Well, you can get my book by going to Amazon. It's out there. Just go under um, Am I Gay and use my name, my first or last name, G-A-R-R-Y. I have two, two R's in my first name, uh, just because a whole bunch of other crap pulls yeah. up if you don't use my name in there. And But our website is loveandtruthnetwork.com. We have a weekly podcast out there as well, both in video and audio. Uh, yeah, just want to be a strength and a support to the church and to moms and dads and to strugglers as well. Awesome. Uh, I will put that up on my social media too and give Thanks, links Ryan. to everything. It's been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, I appreciate you. Take care. Thanks.